hello. Um, just a very short introduction before we start. Lunch Bites, thinking about digital art and culture. <clears throat> I am Elena Kalinowska, Director of Hi. Public Programs and Education at the Hirjon Museum and Sculpture Garden in Washington, DC. Lunch Bites started in the fall of 2010 in a collaboration between the Goethe Institute Washington, Smithsonian Hirjon Museum and Sculpture Garden, the Swiss Arts Council Pro Helvetia, and the Embassy of Switzerland in Washington. We collectively organized Lunch Bites, a series of events dedicated to digital art and culture in a wide range of perspectives. The whole series has been beautifully conceptualized and curated by Melanie Buchler. The series consists of lunchtime events, each dedicated to a different topic and bringing together American, German, Swiss artists, media scholars, game designers, curators, and intellectuals. Each season culminated with an evening event which featured art and live music performances. Artists were always present with us. Just a short introduction to Melanie Buchler, who I'm very grateful for a fabulous uh, series of amazing events. Thank you. She has got an MA in art history at the University of Zurich, specializing in the historical transformation of visual culture in the national context. After completing her studies, she worked on a film and exhibition projects and conceptualized and coordinated cultural events in Europe and the US. Melanie currently works as a program curator at the Goethe Institute in Amsterdam and additional works as a freelance curator. I also would like to thank very much Art Basel Miami for inviting the group and inviting us and especially the people behind the art salon, Mike Cruz and Claudio Vogt. Thank you and enjoy yourself. Um, hi, can you all hear me well? Great. So first of all, thank you very much, Milena. Thank to, a big thank you to all the spa, uh, partners involved, the Hirschrum Museum and Sculpture Garden, the Goethe Institute, Paul Fezia, um, and of course, Art Basel Miami Beach. Thank you so much for having us. Thanks, Claudio Vogt, for making this possible. And also, thanks uh, to Mike Cruz, the um, curator of this program. Today's Lunch Bites event is entitled New Media, New Markets, Buying, Selling, and Collecting Digital Art. Before I dive into the topic uh, of the event, I would like to introduce to you the um, panelists of today's panel. Let me start with uh, Sabine Himmelsbach. Sabine Himmelsbach is the artistic director of HEC, which stands for House of Electronic Arts Basel, Switzerland. Before taking um, this position last March, she worked as the exhibition director of ZKM, Center for Art and Media, Karlsruhe, Germany and as the artistic director of the Edith Roos site for media arts in Oldenburg, also in Germany. Sabine has extensively dealt with, curated, and written about digital art. In her position at HEC, she also oversees the collection of the institute. Then, um, sitting right next to me, we have um, Miltos Manetas. Miltos Manetas is a Greek-born artist and collector who currently lives in Rome. Uh, in 1996, when he was invited to Nicola Burio's seminal traffic exhibition, he brought a laptop and a canvas, painting his computer. This fascination with digital technology continues to inform his work and resulted in many and very diverse on and offline projects, such as interactive websites, videos of games, and performances recorded with his BlackBerry. He has worked as a curator, setting up projects like the online exhibition WhitneyBiennial.com, um, as well as the Internet Pavillon at the Venice Biennial in 2009. He also collects digital art as a private collector and currently works um, for the Museum of Contemporary Art in Rome and puts together their 
digital um, collection. Then I move on to um, the far end of this row of panelists. And we have Lindsay Howard here as well. Lindsay um, Howard is the curatorial director of 319 uh, schools, which is a gallery space for digital arts and experimentation in Bushwick, Brooklyn. Um, she is also currently a fellow of the IBEAM um, Art and Technology Center in New York. She has organized and curated numerous exhibitions on digital art. And in April of this year, she organized a special exhibition uh, for a platform called Art Micro Patronage. Art Micro Patronage is an online exhibition space featuring curated shows of digital work which are financed through a patronage system. Her online exhibition for this platform featured work that address issues related um, to the question how digital art could uh, be monetized and commodified. Then, uh, last but not least, uh, Sebastian Quillich. Sebastian Quillich is the president and CEO of Artsy, an art and technology startup company whose mission is, in its own words, to make all the world's art freely accessible to anyone with an internet connection. A site where you can, and I quote again, discover, learn about, and collect art. Previously, Sebastian was an executive at Christie's, Christie's Auction House. He's also the co-founder and chairman of Project Arte. Is it pronounced this way? That's right, yeah. Uh, an international uh, non-profit art school and art gallery for young emerging artists. So, uh, in this Lunch Bites um, talk, we are going to talk about the connections between the art world and the digital realm. On one hand side, we are going to discuss how digital art can be sold, bought and collected and question the relation of new media and net-based art with the art market. On the other hand side, we're also going to address how digital technologies have affected the art market and have become tools to sell, promote, and collect art. So uh, and now I come to my first question. Uh, first of all, thank you for being here. It's really a pleasure to have you all here. I would like to start with a very general, basic question, and I would like to um, address it to you, Sabine. Um, to start off, I would like um, to ask you, what is digital art? For people who um, haven't yet had the chance to discover this type of art, what should one have in mind? Well, digital art... Uh is art that uses digital technology uh, for its practice, for its production, or also for the presentation. It's, uh, well, my understanding of it is also very wide. So it's also about the effects and the impact that digital technologies have on our society, on our perception and environment. Mm. And um, if we talk about digital art and we um, the subject of this talk is to contextualize it a little bit in the context of the broader art world. Where do you think, what kind of relation has digital art to the, to the rest of the art world? How does it function within that cosmos? Well, uh, the history showed that uh, digital art is, and I, I think it's still kind of problematic. It was always a bit uh, marginalized. So uh, it started in the 60s that artists collaborated with scientists and with uh, technicians to create, uh, to create works. And again, historically, it was more difficult to uh, get your hands on specific technologies. When you think of the early silicon graphics machines that were really expensive, so you needed to make uh, contacts now technology is ubiquitous and it's uh, totally accessible for everyone. So this has changed and I think, but I think that the change that uh, it's really merged with the contemporary art world has not happened yet, but I, that I, I see that there are 
uh, possibilities now that you know that it diffuses and is more uh, recognized. And um, Miltas, Miltas, you as an artist, um, you have worked a lot with the digital realm. Can you describe a little bit your practice and your fascination with the dig with digital technologies? Uh, right. First of all, uh, I don't have any fascination with digital technologies. I am interested in art that lives in the realm of digital. Mm -hmm. So this isn't necessarily digital. It's just art that ha inhabits, uh, that plays, right? And for me personally, it all started uh, from, uh, from the surface. I am a painter and uh, I start looking on computers and video games. Not because I was fascinated by them, but because uh, I needed a subject of representation. So I start painting them first. Mm -hmm. Then I had this idea to sit some of them in a psychanalyst sofa at my studio in New York. And that was quite a dangerous thing to do because then they start exp expressing their subconscious. So I started listening a little bit what uh, those machines had to say, the hidden part. Mm -hmm. And that was back in 96, 97. So I started working with video games also. Um, but not like using video games, but really extracting from video games some of the subconscious that the video games yes had mm -hmm. and uh, later networks came and the internet so i kind of fall in the black hole of what we call digital yeah and this went uh, up to 2009 uh, i did the internet pavilion mm -hmm. and i kind of hit on a wall there because you can't go that far i yeah. mean you can go up to what we call today internet, which actually is not very internetic. It's a little bit limited network. So there I kind of got bored and uh, also not very happy with contemporary new media. Mm -hmm. And I left the scene. And uh, two years later now I am, I am back again. So my interest is not exactly what really exists now, but how can we modify it and bring it to a whole new level? Mm -hmm. The same time from 2000 until now, I really did a lot of work together with my friends. We create a new art movement uh, called NEN, N -E -N. And, um, and we established this idea that websites are the new artworks. Mm -hmm. So from a collector's point of view, that kind of art lives there, exists on the web, and you have to buy it inside the web, right? Yeah. So um, this actually brings us to the very core of this talk. Right. Um, how can a website be sold? And how can a website get collected? And um, to introduce that concept, I want to um, read a quote by Lindsay, actually, that I also used um, to announce uh, the talk. Uh, Lindsay, in that show that I brief briefly mentioned uh, in the biography, she um, wrote up a curatorial statement, and in that statement she wrote, over 20 years have passed since net art first appeared on the screen, and we still don't have an established system for buying and selling it. The greatest developments in the field aren't coming from institutions, curators, or dealers, but, but from artists who are experimenting with payment and distribution models in ways that are at once creative and practical. So, Lindsay, maybe you want to contextualize that statement a little bit for us? Sure. Um, that, can you hear me? No. Um, Hello? Can you Hello? talk a little bit and then we can see? Hello? Yep. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So that exhibition, the goal of it was really to point toward what I, um, this movement that I was seeing of artists taking into their own hands. Um, Lindsay, sorry, maybe you want, need to like hold this? the microphone a little bit, right? Like that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah? Perfect. Right. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, 
So that exhibition, what That's I was right. really trying to do is point toward this movement of artists who are really taking their careers in their own hands. And the advantage of working online is that you don't have a curator or a gallerist telling you, your work is great, now you can show it, now it's able to be viewed by the public. You have all the tools to be able to do that and distribute your own work, create and distribute your own work yourself, which is a big responsibility. Um, but what I saw was that artists who were doing this were bringing um, their own unique ideas about monetization that were particular to their own work um, and bringing that as um, a unique model that reflected something about their aesthetic. Um, and I think that the reason why artists are willing to do this now, to be the artist, the curator, the collector, all of this at the same time, is because we're living in a world that we have increasingly um, limited resources, financially, um, even space-wise, living in New York, it's just not feasible for a lot of artists to afford to have an apartment and then also a separate studio space. Um, and one of my um, one of my favorite stories that I like to tell about this actually is an artist named John Transu. He lives in Philadelphia. And when he graduated from the University of Delaware with a degree in sculpture, he had all these large sculptures that he had created while he was in school, but now he had no place to store them and no longer had the tools to be able to continue working on them. So he just took them all and put them in the dumpster. Hmm. All he had left now is he's, um, as he's applying for grants and seeking out exhibition opportunities were these images that he had taken of all of these sculptures. And he became obsessed with them altering the images, um, changing the scale of them, or improving the colors, making them sharper, smoothing them over. What interested him now was no longer these large sculptures that he didn't even have space for or the money to produce, but just the image was so fascinating. So he has this great quote where he said, after I graduated, I bought a domain, johntransu.net, and my .net became my practice, my .net became my show. And I think that's a really good metaphor for a lot of artists who are working right now and creating monetization models that are really specific to their practice. Mm. Some, they're making open source, um, like Raphael Rosendahl's website image con or website, uh, uh, website sales contract yeah. um, that other artists can use, but it's still really reflective of his practice, and I think that's, that's pretty interesting. Yeah. Miltos, when you, you have also experienced um, experimented with websites, right? Um, so if you want to sell a piece that is essentially a website, how do you go about it? Right, actually this is the easiest thing in the world and uh, it's actually the only kind of art that is safe in terms of copying to acquire because when you sell a website, what you sell is the website. Mm -hmm. So you actually sell the domain name so let's say if you want to buy my jesusswimming.com, I'm going to sell you the domain, and that's a unique domain. Nobody else can make another jesusswimming.com. So people, maybe they can take the content and put it in another website, but that's not the artwork, right? Yeah. Because exactly the web is, a, is an environment built by technology and also by the technology of words that's very important for the web, is a linguistic environment. So that also destroys this myth of digital. The internet is, is not a digital environment, it's partly digital. The other part is linguistic, is the, the fantasy of Jorge Luis Borges, is the bibliotheque, right? Mm -hmm. The archive fever of Derrida, uh, and that's what makes it interesting. So to buy a website and say that this belongs to me, you really need to own the half of it, which is actually its name. Yeah. And this also assures you that nobody can uh, steal it or copy or do anything with it. it. It's like a piece of land. Nobody can put it into question. So in that sense, uh, collecting uh, digital art which lives on the web actually is the smartest thing to do in our days. But how do you actually own a website? You own it because uh, you own it because I, I pass you that certificate of authenticity, the register, the registration, and once I pass it to you, it's yours. 
you pay nine uh, dollars per year to to oh, the registration cool. office, right? And you own it forever. Then you can sell it to the Museum of Modern Art or or do whatever you want with it. Mm. It's yours. It's a piece of land. Exactly. But everybody can look at that piece of land. And, that depends of you. That is yeah. like really is like buying a Picasso. Do you want people to see it? Yes. So you open the door of your ha of your home and people can come and watch the Picasso. If you don't want that, you lock the Picasso in a dark room. And actually, this becomes even more interesting because when you buy a website, you become the person that uh, decides its destiny, right? Yeah. So if you will decide, uh, I want this thing to die, you just let it expire, and JesusSwimming.com does not exist anymore. Uh, and that's like the most interesting part from an existential point for a collector. Because not because you have something, but because you protect something. Yeah. And the act of protecting makes it all worthy. So um, now we moved a little bit from the what is digital art, um, describing it a little bit um, to the point of view of the collector. And when we talk about collecting, um, we can also talk about collecting from an institutional point of view, such as. Um, the House of Electronic Arts, where you work, um, Sabine, you also collect pieces, right? Mm -hmm. what, is, what are the challenges that you face when you want to collect a digital art piece, and how do you go about it? Mm. Well, I think it starts to get complicated when it's not just about a website, but yeah. about the network aspect of a piece. To give you an example, we have uh, um, uh, the House of Electronic Arts has participated in a research project with uh, f uh, partners in France, Germany, and Switzerland. And we have uh, one kind of uh, our model project was uh, a piece by Swiss artist Mark Lee titled TV Bot uh, 2.0. The piece is uh, completely net based, and what it does is that it kind of creates. A, uh, a news channel portal with news that is collected from other sources from the web, for example, from webcams, text materials, uh, video materials, and so on. And the core of the piece is that nothing, uh, everything you see must not be older than one hour. So uh, if I switch it off, kind of, then I destroy the piece. Then again, the idea of the artist was that the piece should be online, that people can really use it. So when we bought it, it was really the question to define what are we buying as an institution, and do, uh, can we guarantee that it will be open? Another uh, problem that is then the, con, uh, the aspect of how to preserve it, uh, the piece is based on, uses a lot of flash elements, in five years, probably there will be no more uh, uh, flash will not uh, be working anymore. So how mm -hmm. can that be then shown in five years? Will it uh, aesthetically change, or can we uh, reprogram it so it works uh, with new software? And then again, there was another complication that uh, there's um, uh, a group uh, to people. Uh, a platform in Switzerland called Digital Art Collection, Digital Art Store, that has been started by Annette Schindler and Reinhard Storz, who try to uh, create editions of these online-based works. And they are selling like one hour of the piece as a, as a video format. Oh. So quite complex. And I yeah. think with all the works we have been uh, buying or investigating so far, it's been completely different models that we found so, how to deal with it. So it's maybe it's um, useful to know that internet or digital art is not only just websites. It, 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 there can be complex structures that need to be approached individually when dealing with them, right? For me, yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, we also had a, a presentation space at Liste, the Young Art Fair in Basel uh, this year, and it was quite interesting. We showed an interactive piece by a young Estonian artist uh, called uh, uh, 
the piece is called Media Bubble uh, by Timo Tutz. And the piece was basically just a, a platform in the middle of the floor where people were allowed to step on. And by stepping on and moving this plate, they generated uh, a media stream which came from various newspapers, uh, like local and international and so on. So you were, with your interaction, you created kind of the news. And then people, and I was actually quite surprised that there was a really strong interest. I think we had 15 or more mm -hmm. uh, uh, interests in, in buying the piece. And the first question was always, what exactly are we buying? So. What is, is it kind of the physical object, the technology involved, and so on. And uh, it was quite interesting to help people with that because it was really kind of the customized hardware, internet connection, and then, of course, the, the projection technology was not included because that's really s specific to where you are, you know, installing it in your home. Yeah, so then I'm wondering, is how well introduced is the market to digital art? Sebastian, in your function as um, the president of Artsy and also at Christie's, do you have experience with selling um, pieces that have digital elements or are um, mainly digital? So I, I should begin by saying that I'm probably the least qualified person here to talk about net art or digital art. Um, but. Um, with respect to selling it, and specifically at Artsy right now, although I think there's a very natural affinity between our approach, which is really the marriage of art and technology to create this platform, um, and the talented engineers we hire, which I, uh, and designers um, who work very closely with art historians and are, I think, trying to create the kind of digital experience and equivalent that uh, great museums or galleries or fairs like Art Basel create in the real world. Mm -hmm. We are trying to create kind of a digital complement to that. Um, that said, we've just started dipping our toe in the water. Um, we have a net art gene and interactive genes and uh, we've partnered with some uh, both institutional partners like Rhizome uh, and some commercial galleries like Bitforms uh, that sell digital art. Um, but we're really, really just getting started. Um, I did, when, when I was at Honcha Venice, and I had the opportunity to work with Rafael Lozano Hammer, um, and with him I do remember, and he's kind of, I guess, on the edge, or at least certainly on one portion of kind of technology-based art, um, and I do remember, for example, with one of his light pieces that uses incandescent light bulbs, and there was, uh, a major museum acquisition and one of the big questions was well incandescent light bulbs will probably be gone in 15 20 years and so you know how many a very concrete questions how many light bulbs should we buy and how long does the piece need to exist like is it okay to say that this piece will exist for a hundred years and you calculate how frequently the light bulbs will burn out and you say okay you need 50,000 light bulbs and that gives you a hundred years for the piece and so on um, so I think there, from there, and then you get to much, I think, questions around, you know, how will digital art, net art, uh, be sold online? I think the, you know, the, the, question, the comment from Lindsay about uh, artists having their own means to be curators and uh, producers and gallerists, I think while it's true, finding an audience in an increasingly crowded internet um, is not easy. And I think there is a role uh, for many platforms and there is, uh, you know, our friends at uh, Tumblr and uh, Paddle 8 are doing this uh, GIF uh, project now and you have people doing interesting things like uh, at Sedition where they're selling editions of works and I don't think anyone's quite figured it out yet. It's not clear uh, what the models will be. Yeah. Um, but I think as technology and the internet and digital space is an increasingly important part of our lives. You know, as my kid tries to swipe a TV screen at the age of two, it's very clear that, you know, 
digital art will become much more important in the contemporary art world, I think, mm -hmm. because it's just more important. Digital technology is more important in our lives, and artists ultimately respond to the world. Absolutely. I actually wanted to um, ask you about that as well, Lindsay. When you say that the um, artists are taking on so much more than they used to, is that actually working? Can an artist work who works dig digital, is he able to sell his stuff? Is he able to make a living or she? And does that work, that new role? Um, from what I've seen, there are people who are having success with this. Um, uh, artists like Raphael Rosendahl, whose work is very graphic, very aesthetically driven, so I think that it would appeal to a mainstream art audience because it's on a screen, but it looks um, as if it could be just as stunning as a painting or a print. Um, another artist, Petra Courtright, has an algorithm that she came up with. She, um, it, she performs in these videos that she uploads to YouTube, and um, she's come up with an algorithm based on how many YouTube views her videos get times a certain number, that's the value of the work at any given time. So it, the work remains online, but the more people look at it, the more they share it, the more they view it, the more it increases in value, which is wouldn't work for everyone because it's kind of a popularity-driven model, hmm. but given her work, which is a lot about it's kind of a, a cam girl sort of performance, um, it, it fits quite well. So yeah. There are people who are successfully doing it. So um, is it just individual artists at this point who figured out a good way to, to price their work, to, um, to promote their work, and, but a real structure hasn't emerged, right? Well, I know one of your questions is, um, is there an art market for digital art? Yeah. But I was thinking about that. I think it's actually plural, that there are art markets, and that artists right now are navigating this and experimenting with a lot of different potential models. So we wouldn't be here if there was a universal model that worked for everyone. Um, but there are a lot of um, potential ways to make this happen. Um, I was just noticing this week there were two major events that happened. Um, one is LA Game Space, um, a venue in Los Angeles um, that is coming together to organize workshops, talks, provide residencies for artists who are working in the video game field, um, received over $300,000 in Kickstarter funding to make this space possible and had over 8,000 backers to support them. So my sense is that either there's going to be one very, very rich person who supports all of these artists to allow their work to happen, or it's going to be crowdfunded by a great number of people who believe in it so much that they want to contribute. And even if it's a dollar or $10 or $25,000, whatever it might be, hmm. that's kind of what my sense is, is that it might end up being a lot of different people coming together. Yeah. So maybe we can talk a little bit more about um, your initiative, uh, Sebastian. Um, so you mentioned a few of these um, art and art startup that have surfaced in the last years. Why do you think that happened at this point? And why do you think there are, like from an outsider perspective, almost um, all of a sudden, all of these different platforms who are trying to um, to get online and sell art, promote art, what's what's behind that? Well, I, I think for a little history, um, you know, although I'm, I'm only I'm one of the few people at our company who was out of college then, the you know there was a first wave in '99 of a lot of uh, online art startups and the same kind of energy and enthusiasm around it. You know, Sotheby's themselves invested tens of millions of dollars. Um, and there's been companies that have been pioneers like Artnet that within the a specific niche about kind of information about the market uh, have been quite successful and I think play a very important function. Um, I think now is there's a general um, 
more widespread acceptance. You know, I mentioned my swipe, my son swiping a TV screen. I think you know products uh, from companies like Apple that are just kind of mass consumer products and you know ready access to digital all the time with your phone in your pocket, etc. So all the things that everyone talks about, I think, means that you know it's no longer uh, you know the geeks who are interested or comfortable with technology. I think mm -hmm. it's just increasing comfort level. Um, I think it's also from a market perspective, uh, the art industry is very big and it's been largely, uh, it has largely underinvested in technology and in kind of world-class technology in the past. And so I think, uh, you know, in any market, uh, when there's underinvestment, suddenly people go in to see if, where there may be opportunities. Um, I think part of the reason that there is so many players also has to do with it's a really complex market. Yeah. And I think that means that the models that will work have not yet been figured out. Um, you know, our approach is that we believe there's a lot of great art content that's out there, uh, but it's largely unstructured. Um, and so great stories and uh, you know, the kind of storytelling around art and uh, images to art are just not readily available uh, to the general public. And I think you know, as a result of that, you get things like Jerry Saltz, you know, one of my favorite art writers who is writing in a prominent publication like New York Magazine and says that the top his five or ten favorite artworks of 2011 and I looked online right before the lecture and there was one image of the Christian Marclay cloth that was a medium resolution image a few inches wide um, and two thumbnails right and so you're talking about the art and there's all this great art content but there is no place uh, there's there isn't access to the images and so we believe that there's opportunities uh, to make those images available and to make you know, are accessible to a much larger audience. Mm -hmm. um, and with that, I want to make the panelists ex accessible to a much larger audience. <laughs> and um, I would like to open it for questions. Um, I believe there is a microphone. Yes, it's right there. So this lady in the front row has a question. Um, hello, I work with art video and even with my work as a videoast, I was in the Venice Biennale in 2007 and some other places. So the video is in my head in a fundamental way, more than art too. And I, if you permit me, I think that we don't uh, arrive to a reality that is the nature of this work, which is art video, is completely different, I believe, to what is this war outside, which is for a collector or someone who wanted to buy something, is to possess. If we think, for example, that a video art could be like a son of cinema um, or some just image, the way that how public and the big public can have it is another type of distribution and is not exactly related with possession. Mm -hmm. But when you go to the cinema, you pay some dollars to see the film, or if you go to, so it's more for festival context, or if we must create a type of mm, channels of distribution of um, promotion of all the entire our art, um, artists, our world, and to wait to pay some rights to those artists and you know like uh, it's another word like singers or like cinema or like so you won't receive one million dollars for one video that you produce in any moment and you have to just to change your mind and it's another type of public that now has the possibility to acquire um, so what you're saying is there it's a new form of ownership maybe that yes. is involved another profile of collector that also is related with the big changes of humanity yeah. this we know exactly that is temporal and we are managing all of that trying to put it in a context that is not our video for this context exactly so, so, so my question to any one of you is like I have the impression that in thousands of 
2001 and two, we used to see much more our video everywhere on the air fairs in different formats, very interesting. And that have been decreasing so much and we don't see too much, well, some segments here in this case, but in other fairs in Paris, I live in Paris, or in other countries, mm -hmm. uh, it's disappearing. So why do we have to think in commercial um, topics if this is not the base of the video? So is this decreasing really? How you, how you uh, graphic the line of video operation? So like are that, you like asking that? about video art now? OK. Um, <laughs> maybe this is a question for you then, Sabine, because you have a little bit of a background in media art that is maybe a little broader. And you also mentioned that you almost um, haven't seen media art here, right? Yeah, I mean, mm. uh, maybe I can answer it more generally, not just uh, regarding video art, but media art. What? Mm. Uh, well, I have not seen very much uh, media-based art here at the Art Basel, and my impression in general is um, you mentioned uh, models, how artists uh, deal with and, and try to find a new models. Um, the, the, the artists I spoke with, or kind of like some Swiss artists that we worked with that we want to have in our collection, for example, there's a strong tendency towards uh, objectification, kind of to create something that is collectible, kind of is it an edition or it comes with yeah, some, some documentation of parts of a uh, naturally online based work and so on. And yeah, my impression is that uh, there's, when we ask about the markets, that there's still not a, a huge market for really digital based uh, work. So and I think, again, with, the, with video art, um, yeah, maybe it's kind of having an object is kind of being on the safe side because what what is also the uh, the pr I mean it needs an investment in care and management if you buy uh, a digital work it's not that this is immaterial you know you also have to provide uh, the technological means you have to have service space and so on and and uh, not uh, many institutions and uh, even less uh, uh, private persons are, you know, want to deal with all what is involved in, in, in buying such a work. Yeah. And Can I, I say something? I, yeah. Um, uh, excuse me, I just want to say something. Yeah, yeah. I think that this question of how do you buy and how do you sell digital mm. art and all this uh, kind of uh, uh, quest is a kind of a false uh, direction, right? Okay. Because we all know that uh, when you buy a work of art, you don't buy a work of art. Mm -hmm. What you buy is a certificate of something, right? So how do you sell a uh, digital artwork? In the same way that you sell or you buy anything, right? It's a certificate where the artist signs. Actually, what you sell uh, when you are an artist is not your artwork, but you are selling your signature on the signature there is this illustration that happens to be a painting, it happens to be a website or whatever. So it's, it's a false uh, quest to search how we're going to buy or sell digital art in the same way as we did. Uh, always. Like, we make the certificate, we put the signature, sale. That's it. Finito. Uh, then how much uh, this will cost? The, can it cost a million dollars or, or five dollars? It can cost anything because, again, it's about the signature. So as we know, like, it is about, like, I have this signature of this artist or of the other, and the money there can have a lot of numbers or few numbers. So also this is a fake kind of quest. But I mean, it is a difference if I have, if I buy a painting and then I can have it up on my wall. Right, but exactly the same way when you buy a website, you can have it up on your wall. Of course. Only that your wall will be the digital wall, which is actually today a, a real wall. wall. Mm -hmm. Or you can also put it on your wall, like project it. So there is no difference there, really. Sure. Actually, um, it's absolutely. I would disagree with that. There, I think there is a difference. What's the difference? It's another form, it's another material, it's, it's another um, feeling and, and, about it. And I it. think one difference is, 
frankly, just people's willingness to do it. Yeah. Um, there seems to be a greater willingness to buy a physical object than there is to buy uh, an object which doesn't have a physical representation. But I do think, going back to your question, so we're at Artsy starting to think about uh, how we're going to do video art. And we've done a couple of collaborations and put out our own films, um, but now we are doing partnerships. I, I won't say, I don't think they've been announced yet, but we're doing partnerships uh, with video art archives to have video art on the site. Um, and as with anything, we think that it's, you know, introducing uh, our users to video art, but I can imagine down the line, I mean, I was talking to a dealer and I said, like, what would be the ideal platform that artists would be comfortable uh, with? And she said to me, I think artists want to get paid while they sleep. Um, right, and exactly. I well, think, that's beautiful. And, and, and I think, you know, you could imagine right. some some kind of micropayments model, right? The same way that on iTunes you can download, you know, a song for a dollar. I think if people could download video art in a similar way, I think they would be very comfortable doing it and I think there would be there would not be much temptation to cheat. I mean, people are here at this fair partly because they love the objects and they love the art, et cetera, but also people like the idea that they're supporting and making this possible. And I think video art and a micropayment system, for example, is one of, I think, many ideas, uh, could have, uh, oh, could get a lot of traction. That's true, and Lindsay actually worked um, on a project like this, the, the one that I briefly mentioned in her introduction. I'm very sorry, but our time is already up. <laughs> It happened so fast, and um, but thank you for coming. And I'm sorry that we could only take one question. And there are uh, leaflets with the talk, with the question, and with the biographies of the panelists, and also little flyers. You find there our uh, website. It's called lunchbites.com. There you can um, you can access a lot more information, links, um, and yeah, please visit. And thanks to our wonderful panelists. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.